Hello, everybody. This is the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group General Meeting uh, for September 28th. It's been a few weeks uh, since our last meeting, so there's a lot of items on the agenda today. So thank you for joining me, everybody. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this will be recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you're interested in the Linux Foundation antitrust policy, uh, please review that in the agenda page here. Um, I don't think there's anybody new on the call today, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on with community announcements. We do have one announcement here. This is related to a person that was very active in the blockchain and healthcare community, Kevin Clausen. Um, he recently passed away. He was a professor at uh, Lipscomb and Lipscomb University. And I just wanted to give a few minutes for anyone here who'd like to share any memories they've had with Kevin. I remember he was one of the first people I initially spoke with um, about blockchain and healthcare. So he was very excited and invigorated about the, the prospect of how this can change the industry. Um, but if there's anybody else I'd like them to share too. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I met Kevin back in 2017. At, in Nashville at a blockchain and healthcare conference. And um, he was really one of the first people that I met too. And I actually met a bunch of his students as well. And I could just see how excited they were about learning about blockchain and new technology. So he was really like embedding all this stuff into these younger students. And it was really awesome to see that. Um, and he really got me excited in, about the space. I don't even know if I would have I would have kept going without his networking. He was like such a connector and just connected so many people. Um, and you know, he's written he's written several things that have been published. And his last uh, thing that he wrote right before he died was uh, a segment in Wendy Charles' book, which I think we're going to talk about. Um, so it's just really cool to see that he got that he got that in before he passed away. And he was very private and he never shared that this was happening. So it was quite a shock to the community. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say he'll be he'll be missed. Thank you, Erica. Appreciate that. If anybody else wants to say something, um, feel free to do so. Otherwise, may Kevin rest in peace. And we are very appreciative for the work he's done. Okay. Um, Moving on to some of the upcoming events that are happening related to blockchain and healthcare, there's an event on October 10th through the 14th in Dubai. Uh, it's called a Block Health Summit. And this is, I think, sponsored in part or in whole by Patient Tory Association. Uh, you could buy tickets. Uh, I believe it's uh, both in person you know, and online. So Feel free to check that out. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. Yeah, it's in Dubai. And then we also have the World Health Summit in Berlin and online as well. Uh, then there's the MedTech Conference in Boston, October 24th through the 26th. And then Health 2022 in Las Vegas on November 13th through the 16th as well. So if there are any other events that you are aware of related to healthcare and blockchain, um, please feel free to make a comment or let us know. All right, moving on to some industry news articles and interesting projects. There's projects. a lot. Sorry, go ahead. There was someone. Actually, I was, it wasn't me, but I was going to ask how Con V2X was last, was it last week or? Yes. Yeah, so I actually, that thanks for bringing that up, Erica. So I attended the Convi2x meeting. I was a symposium. Uh, there were a few people there uh, that I've known for a while as well in the space, um, like Kyle Culver, um, who's the leader of the Synaptic Health Alliance. Uh, there were a few others as well. And I could show you the agenda here. I was actually in a, in a conversation on stage as well with Daniel Urabe from Genobank. And it was a good event, I think. Um, Avenir Health was the sponsor of the event. So we heard some talks from them and their leadership. It was very interesting. Jim Nasser, you guys are probably aware of his work as well, 
with Hedera and Oker, Acre. Um, yeah, I think it was a really good time. Mark Treshock was there, Chris Moose. Robert Chu, founder lots of, of Amoeba. Lots of, lots of familiar people all from the past. It's cool. Yeah. And not too many new people, I would say, but I think there were a couple of interesting talks that were I didn't know much about. There was a talk on quantum technology and how that is going to impact blockchain, healthcare blockchain, quantum computing threats and opportunities. This was very eye opening. Um, and yeah, metaverse, NFTs. I was in this panel. Mm. Uh, yeah, they didn't change the name, but it was a good, I thought, good event, very focused. Not huge, but it was good for the community to get together in person and discuss some of the updates that they have. So it was nice. And Austin is a beautiful city, so a lot of fun. Any other events? Yeah, if I go to the, 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 the Linux thing in Dublin. Yes, that's true. So the, the Linux Foundation hosted their global forum. Uh, I did not attend, but I heard it was a great time as well. I think, yeah, there was a huge number of events, not just related to healthcare, but I haven't gotten a direct update from someone who was actually there. But if anyone here has any updates, feel free to share. Huge list of speakers. It was like a multi-day yeah. thing. Yeah, it's the annual big deal for Hyperledger. I'm surprised none of us could have made it. But uh, hey, Ray, actually, I attended the sessions virtually, mostly Hyperledger Fabric uh, and uh, uh, its related applications. Um, so some of the companies gave the presentations, and even they gave the demos also. Uh, uh, you were there, Ramesh? One of, uh, I did not go to the Dublin, but I attended virtually. Excellent. Awesome. Uh, one of the Brazil company has given the demos on the healthcare section, actually. Uh, the recordings are already there in this uh, allevents.com. Uh, required, you know, I can share the details. You guys can go through the uh, events which are hosted in the Dublin. <clears throat> yes, that would be amazing, Ramesh, if you can share that. I see that there are some updated videos here. In their uh, YouTube not channel, all the but videos, I don't think some basic uh, videos they uploaded, but not all the you know events which are hosted. I'll share the uh, username and password so you guys can log into that and uh, check the health related yeah, uh, awesome. events. Which are hosted. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll be sure to check that out too. Okay, um, gonna jump into some of the articles I thought that were interesting worth mentioning today. First one is from Health Tech Magazine. So basically the FBI and the CISA, which is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, released a warning of a ransomware called Zeppelin for healthcare organizations. So um, threat actors using Zeppelin have requested ransom payment in Bitcoin with initial amounts ranging from several thousand dollars to more than a million dollars. So this has been a issue for hospitals for a number of years now, but um, you know, this is a specific warning from the FBI and CISA about Zeppelin specifically. I'm not going to get into too much detail here. I just wanted to mention that. And if anyone has any comments, feedback, feel free to just jump in. All right, so the World Economic Forum posted this article on September 16th saying, is blockchain a solution for failing global healthcare? And it talks about some of the you know, reports on global health, including like Deloitte's 2022 report on how the industry is at a breaking point after COVID. Um, they talk about how blockchain-based solutions for health documentation offer secure encryption techniques that safeguard the integrity of individuals' information when communicating with different parties. Um, so this is just good to see that the World Economic Forum, which is you know a global player here, 
is sharing these ideas that blockchain can be a force for good for the healthcare space. Um, yeah, with so much at stake, it's impossible to think that the inefficient, overly bureaucratic and failing healthcare industry that we are experiencing that we are experiencing today can continue for patients, practitioners, executives. It's time to accept the technology and systems based advancements at our disposal. So that's, you know, a call to action in a way from the world economic forum. Uh, after hearing about quantum computing, this article showed up in my feed somehow, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin versus quantum computers. U.S. government says post-quantum world is getting closer and CISA warns contemporary encryption could break. This is becoming more and more of a concern. There are arguments to say that blockchain can become quantum resistant as well. So here, um, researchers say Bitcoin's public key technology leverages multiple quantum resistant one-way hash functions. Some blockchain projects prepare for a post-quantum world. So I think this is pretty interesting to at least consider. And when you're, especially when you're choosing a blockchain protocol for any development work. Yeah, the debate has raged on for, I'm just quoting here again, the debate has raged on for years and many people think the government's warnings and the recent quantum-based technological achievements by Honeywell, Google, Microsoft, and others are the incentives people need to embrace post quantum cryptography. So this is going to become more and more of a topic, I think, in the years to come. Um, so we'll, we'll keep following it. Anyone have here have experience with quantum hardware or computing? Quantum, is it from consensus? Uh, not, not say again, sorry. Uh, quantum is the framework from uh, Consys company. Oh, uh, no. So uh, quantum computing refers to the, the general advancement of classical computing to quantum computing where bits are no longer zeros and ones, but you can hold states in qubits, which are zero, one or something in between. So it's a different different um a totally different structure for how we can do computing in the future and different hardware oh, okay. yeah got it. Sorry. yeah yeah not quant there is i think a protocol called quantum which is different a blockchain protocol called quantum which is different than this yeah so i i don't understand it that much either ray but like the theory is that with the quantum computing that you can break into and get yeah. access to different blockchain protocols depending and then they're trying to be resistant now and are, are they not already i mean i'm just still trying to figure out it's a tough so it's not really clear to me either my understanding is that um with companies starting to work on quantum computers if one of these companies or groups are successful in being able to break some of the existing encryption standards we have now um they would be able to basically essentially you know reveal all our passwords uh in a way so i think that's the the fear there are ways to mitigate around it again i'm not an expert in this it's just i know that people are working on you know creating blockchain that is quantum resistant so here i'm just pointing out Meanwhile, Ethereum developers have been researching quantum resistance alongside the Hyperledger Foundation's distributed ledger project, URSA. So I think this is relevant. And uh, cryptographers preparing for a post-quantum world believe encryption techniques like AES-128 and RSA-2048 will not provide adequate security against quantum attacks. So... Um, yeah, that's kind of, I hope that answers part of your question, Erica. Yeah, yeah it's concerning. <laughs> it is, yeah. I think a lot of people are worried, concerned about it. And even the government now is suggesting that we need to look at this ASAP. Um, 
especially when you have nation states also investing in their quantum computing research and development. So yeah, it could be a in very interesting time if that happens. Okay, uh, this article is from Extreme Tech, White House bans paywalls on taxpayer funded research. I thought this was a positive piece of news saying that if there is research that is done and it's funded by taxpayers, those journals or articles should be free, should be available. Um, and I think that's a step in the right direction. Just wanted to point that out. So publicly funded research will now be public and you won't have to pay a journal like Nature or, or whatever, um, you know, tens, hundreds of dollars to access those articles. So good job, White House. Okay. Next up here from Coindesk, we have the Treasury wants public comments on illicit crypto activity. So this is interesting because what we're seeing here is that the Department of the Treasury is actually asking the public about how crypto is being used illicitly. I, I find that pretty interesting. Um, I'm sure, I, I mean, I imagine the people that are using it illicitly are not going to be telling the Treasury Department how they are doing it. Uh, but I'm sure that there are some people that are aware of activities going on. They, not, they might not be participating in the illicit activities themselves, but if they do, have some awareness about it, they can report it, or at least they can discuss it. So this is more of like an open public forum. And frankly, I think it's good that the government is asking the public for input on how they should proceed forward because crypto is gonna be a very complicated thing to regulate. Um, and some might argue if you can regulate it at all, uh, but we're seeing that you could, you know, especially with centralized technologies and systems that still do have to report to um, existing institutions. So that's this. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this ongoing work. Just to clarify here, um, it, they do say that it's unclear whether the U.S. will actually issue a dig digital dollar, because I think that's the reasoning behind why they're trying to get more information about crypto or what it might take to produce one. The Department of Justice is looking at the question of what legal authorities the Federal Reserve might need to issue a central bank digital currency, though it is not though it has not submitted this analysis to the president yet. Relatively early, I suppose. <clears throat> Okay, next is another Coindesk list of best universities. So they listed and ranked the 50 top schools that teach blockchain to their students. Uh, they screened from a sample of 240 institutions worldwide and based it on their scholarly, industrial, and pedagogical, uh, pedagogical, pedagogical impact on blockchain. Can't say that. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, they have the list here. Thought it was interesting. Hong Kong Polytechnic University was number one. University of Singapore as well, um, number two, and University of Zurich number three. And you can see a list of other schools. Some in the U.S., some in Asia, Europe, kind of mixed here. And you know, Cornell, UC Berkeley, um, Stanford University are some of the ones in the U.S. New York University. So I thought this was pretty interesting because in the past there have been members of the of this special interest group asking about courses related to blockchain, specifically healthcare and blockchain. Um, and I suspect there must be some of these universities teaching that subject at their schools. Um, haven't dug into that specifically, but this is a cool list to get get you started. Okay. Uh, next here, we have a, let's see where it is, an opinion piece about what post row America tells us about the need for privacy in web three. This is written 
September 9th. I thought it was interesting because I, we've talked about this topic in the past before in this meeting. Uh, so it was cool to see or interesting to see some of the examples that people have actually faced. Like for example, here in Nebraska, a 17 year old girl and her mother are being prosecuted and will be tried, the girl as an adult, uh, for allegedly using a morning after pill to induce a miscarriage. A child and her mother face lengthy prison terms for newly invented crimes, and it is only possible because Facebook handed over their private messages to Nebraska investigators. I mean, I'm sure this is something that a lot of people are upset about, uh, and I, I don't know what the future would look like, but I think this is something that Web3 can help to mitigate. And I think a lot of us here believe that too. So yeah, I just wanted to bring this up as another example of how women's health and especially reproductive health has, um, has, been, has taken a hit this year. And being able to keep that data private might be a good solution for those individuals. Uh, we just need the tools to be able to do that in the software. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I I totally agree. And I think that I, I still don't understand enough about why and how, what the regulations are and why these messages are able to be released. I, I've heard that it's sort of case by case basis on, on why they are releasing, Facebook's releasing information like this, I guess. I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't understand enough about um, that. But yeah, it's obviously happening and very disturbing. Agreed. Yeah. Um, there are a few people actually I know who are doing some work in the women's reproductive health space in Web three. Uh, Athena Dow comes to mind. Actually, interviewed them recently. So and publishing in a couple days i hope um so might be a good idea to get them on here to talk yeah. to us i feel like this is a topic that is is quite important and the solution I, I don't know what the solutions are it's quite quite difficult to navigate so yeah i've never heard of them so i'd love to i'd love to hear more yeah sure all right uh next up here is from the healthcare it news group. I thought this was a important announcement for the Mayo Clinic to start using blockchain for hypertension clinical trials. So they will be using a software platform called trial, T-R-I-A-L-L, um, who I actually interviewed on my podcast as well. But they'll be doing a two-year multicenter pulmonary arterial hypertension trial. And it includes 10 research sites. So they already have secured 10 sites and more than 500 patients, which is quite impressive. Uh, they'll be using trials veritable proof API. Uh, they'll be doing, they'll be testing end to end clinical data integrity. So ensuring that the data is true and accurate from the beginning of, from the startup to the post study evaluations. So this is something I'll definitely be following as well. Um, the trial company does have a token as well. So the platform uh, token is called TRL. So it's being used to compensate the participants, uh, meaning it is used by third parties to access the platform. Hmm, interesting. So this is not the first time Mayo Clinic has been like experimenting with blockchain. They actually had a, in 2018, they had some project with medical chain for storing electronic medical data uh, and healthcare records, but that didn't work out for some reason. Uh, says the use cases does, does not, or did not resonate for the long term. Um, but again, you know, I know Dr. John Halamka is pro blockchain or, or at least distributed ledger technology. So It'll be interesting to see what the Mayo Clinic continues to do in that space. And yeah, also Mayo Clinic was recently announced as I think one of the smartest hospitals in the world too. 
Um, so it's quite impressive. I hope they're successful. All right, uh, this article from Petapixel. I thought this was interesting because when you think about blockchain and data is real, the provenance of data is accurate. You know, you think about things like deep fakes and forgery for photos as well, because we're seeing a lot of deep fakes online and that's causing a lot of problems, especially geopolitically. Um, and what, you know, Sony is trying to do here is create an in-camera forgery proof photo technology using cryptography um, to ensure that at the point of the capture, there's a signature that is forged in that image, basically a digital signature. And at any point in the future, if you want to ensure or confirm whether or not a photo was real, you can look at that signature and, and verify the authenticity of the image. Um, so Sony joined the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity earlier this year. Um, and there's a few other companies that are part of that. I'm just going to click into here to show you. Um, let's see. Can't seem to find them. Oh, here it is. So the C2PA, uh, which is this content authenticity initiative, um, which includes founding members from Adobe, ARM, BBC, Intel, Microsoft, and Trupic, and Twitter, it says. So I actually didn't notice Twitter was on here the first time I reviewed this page. So it's good that Twitter's on there because there's a lot of fake things on Twitter, as we all know, too. So that's good. I don't know if they're actually using blockchain specifically. Um, but in any case, I think this will be a good way to verify if pictures are real. All right. Another announcement that I saw from Pfizer is that they are interested in investing in VitaDAO. VitaDAO is a decentralized autonomous organization that allows researchers primarily focused on longevity and human life extension. They allow, so VitaDAO is community governed and Pfizer has proposed an investment into VitaDAO and in return, Pfizer would be getting some of the Vita tokens, governance tokens, as well as um, being able to be part of the deal flow that happens in R&D. So it's a really interesting because it sort of validates that Vita DAO and this model is, has potential to work. And Pfizer, knowing that you know it's difficult for a large pharmaceutical company to be as nimble as some of these smaller researchers, um, it allows them to, you know, engage with researchers, but also not have to put up their own costs in order to do the research themselves. So a very interesting model. If you haven't heard of VitaDAO, you should check them out. Um, I was recently at a conference in Boston, DSI Boston, and VitaDAO, there was discussion about them. And they're doing some really difficult, challenging work, but I think it's important work for the future of, of research and, and funding. All right, um, next here for articles, another article about whether blockchain and healthcare is a, a fad or it's here to stay. So what I found interesting in this article was that they do mention some of the names we are familiar with. Uh, for example, here, they talk to <clears throat> Pradeep Gull. He's the CEO of Softcare. And then he says, when you, talk to, when you talk with people in healthcare about blockchain, the first reaction you often get is, I don't want Bitcoin or any of this crypto crap. Uh, so Softcare is a company creating customer relationship management platform using blockchain. 
Um, they've been doing a lot of work internationally as well. And yeah, it's just interesting to see how these mainstream healthcare journals and, and magazines are talking about blockchain more and more. Um, they also mention the Synaptic Health Alliance, and they talked to Kyle Culver as well. So yeah, here it says, in four years, what started as a pilot project has expanded from a initial rollout in Texas to full operation in Colorado, Florida, Michigan, and New York. And he's referring to the Synaptic Health Alliance, which has been very specifically focused on how they can improve the accuracy of provider directories. So yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, they also talk about John Bass, the CEO and founder of Hashed Health, which is a venture studio focused on launching blockchain specific healthcare companies and has been in on blockchain and healthcare longer than most, which is like six years. So very cool. Um, yeah. Any feedback? Okay. All right. So those are some articles and projects I thought they were interesting in the last month or so. I'm sure there's others. And if you know more, you could feel free to add a comment here in the Hyperledger Foundation workspace or even in the YouTube comments too. Um, we'll be sure to try to answer them as fast as we can. So I will move on to educational nuggets. So the first on the list here is a new book that was published recently by Wendy Charles. Uh, Wendy is a member, uh, you know, active member here in the group. She, she joins these meetings from time to time. Unfortunately, she's not here to take it. She's not here today to talk about the book, uh, but um, this is it. It's uh, called Blockchain and Life Sciences. And yeah, and I think Erica, you mentioned that Kevin Clausen was a was an editor or he helped write part of the book as well. Yeah, he has his own chapter in the book. And um, yeah, it's it's a good read. I, I just, it's really well done. I, I've read it. So yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, you guys should check it out. Next in this section, I found a pretty interesting article on how to token gate. And what that means is requiring that an individual or group owns a specific token or NFT in order to access certain features or certain content or things like that. And there's different ways to do this. There are at least 30 ways, and there are examples of those 30 ways here in this article. I'm not going to go through all of them, <laughs> but I just wanted to make you aware of this because, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting to think about the new business models in blockchain. We're all still experimenting. I don't think there's been like a, a perfect way to do things. Um, and here you have 30 different examples of using NFTs to, to do like a token gate. So I'll just read a few examples. Um, here, if I own the NFT, then I could also own the intellectual property rights embedded within the NFT. Depending on the IP language or overlay, this may mean I have rights to create posters, t-shirts, or show the NFT in metaverses. That's one way. Uh, maybe something more familiar. People here is... Like here, if if I have an Adidas into the Metaverse NFT, I get special, I get access to a special edition merch drop and can trade my NFT in for a new one. So just want to point that out. You have different membership NFTs to an investment DAO. Um, yeah, so I think this could be useful if you're interested in developing a, a new way to token gate. Uh, okay, so... Next here, I have, I just wanted to mention that there were three Health Unchained podcast episodes published since we last met. I'm not going to go through them all in detail, but Kyle Culver from the Synaptic Health Alliance, John Hatchell from Tie-Dye Health, and uh, Moro Frota from, from Bout, which is doing something 
quite interesting. They've developed a, a patented brand new sort of kickboxing bag that has sensors and cameras and rewards users for, for activity. Um, so play to earn, I guess, wow. sort of thing. That's creative. Yeah, no, I think they have a lot of potential and, you know, they're already in a few gyms, I think. And um, yeah, listen to the episode if you're interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, next here, IP Watchdog, talking about advocating for ethics-driven regulation for blockchain technologies. So I think the ethics behind how we use blockchain is going to increasingly be more and more important because there's a lot of risk that we take when we start to use blockchain for securing data and information. Um, so being able to create or design a way to ensure that we're building ethically and we're not leaving behind a large uh, group of people, I think is really important. And yeah, so this is just something um, I wanted to bring up, you know, be wary. But given, given the complexity of technologies emerging on blockchain, one should carefully consider the moral issues that have or could emerge when determining use cases. Um, yeah, the more gullible among us should be wary of the real potential for harm. You know, not everybody is a technologist or healthcare professional. Uh, so being able to design for everyone is, is rather really important. Um, there should be, I'm just quoting here again, there should be regulating agencies and institutions insulated from conflict that provide some degree of supervision in order to prevent, deter, and penalize misuse. Yeah, uh, easier said than done. I think doing this in a way that makes sense sustainably for the long term is quite challenging. Um, but if we don't start thinking about it and talking about it, I think, you know, we're not doing anybody a service. So um, I just want to read this last sentence here. Uh, while such oversight is arguably directly in breach of the libertarian freedom aimed, aimed for by this technology, functionality indisputably requires facilitation of function with rules and regulations not only based in ethics, but also the idealized principles of fluid transactions enabled by this platform technology. Something to think about for sure. All right, this was a Vitalik blog posted uh, last week or September 20th. And it just talks about DAOs and how DAOs are not really corporations and we shouldn't try to fit them into the corporate structure. Um, and it goes into some examples of, you know, I think Vita Dow was mentioned in here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, should Vita Dow and Ukraine Dow be Dow's? So Vitalik talks about this and Vita Dow here it says is an is a Dow funding early stage longevity research. Ukraine DAO is a DAO organizing and funding efforts related to helping Ukrainian victims of war and supporting the Ukrainian defense effort. And then it asks, does it make sense for these to be DAOs? Nuanced question. And kind of goes into detail about what a DAO is, what's the purpose, how things can be expected to happen, or get, how work is expected to happen in DAOs, which is still a tough problem. I mean, you have these community members but when you have work that needs to be done, how do you do that or motivate them in a way that's professional enough to be useful and also, um, you know, is in line with the, the goals of the DAO as well. So there's a lot in here, definitely a large educational nugget. I think it's worthwhile if you wanted to check it out. And it does talk about the algorithmic stablecoins Achilles heel, which is the Oracle. And yeah. All right. Um, the next thing I have listed for educational nuggets is this blockchain digital identity kind of small article. 
and they give four different models of what kind of identities you can do online. So siloed identity is one model, federated identity being a second model, blockchain-based identity, and then finally you have um, self-sovereign identity. So we've heard these names before, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have at some point, but here there's some good information on what that really means and it'll help help you explain to someone who's more new to this place. So, yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing this, really helpful. Sure, thank you. Uh, and finally, I do have this last announcement from the FDA regarding digital health software pre-certification pre for pilot programs. Um, this was just released in September as well. And I didn't look through the whole thing, but it is very much targeted towards, you know, digital health startups or companies that are, that want to use their product um, in a pilot program. And there's some recommendations and useful guides for doing so. Um, let's see if there's any high level points worth we're digging into in any case it is the fda so it would certainly be a wise move to understand what's going on here and how it impacts potentially your project or your business yeah um that's all i really wanted to share from my end today happy to go into any discussion if there's anyone that wants to share anything also that's that's fine too okay thank so, you so much for hosting ray this is yeah. super informative sure thank you guys for attending and listening on participating as well i appreciate it all the time i think it's important for us to keep this going because things are developing so quickly and the best way to stay informed is, you know, have these sorts of events and meetings. So um, thank yeah. you all for joining in. Yeah. Thanks hey, for just one thing. The, I think in the Dublin workshop, uh, one of the employees from the Pfizer, uh, uh, she discussed about, uh, you know, investing in the public based uh, crypto coins, actually that session is also there in the uh, Dublin workshop. You guys can go through that. On it. Will you be able to send that over? I just texted in the chat. You guys are able to see that? Oh, let me take a look. Oh, yeah, I do see some chats. Yes. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, okay, let me share it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ramesh. All okay. right, everybody. You guys have a good day and a good week, and talk to you in two weeks. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Ray. Thank you.